Coming up on this week's show, MSX and Neo Geo games could be coming to your Switch. A new roguelike game coming to the Mega Drive. And we chat to Rob Cunningham of Relic all about Homeworld. And the Retro Hour podcast is brought to you every week with our amazing friends at Bitmap Books. Now, we are loving Super Famicom, the box art collection. Now, if you're a fan of Nintendo Super Famicom, you're going to love this collection of box art, chronicling the illustrations that adorned the Japanese packaging during the height of the 16-bit era. So you can check that out and the rest of their retro gaming books at bitmapbooks.com. And with our friends at PCBWay, now they're massive supporters of the retro community. And if you're working on a retro project right now, give them a try. They offer fully featured custom PCB prototyping service with low cost, fast turnaround quality boards and services like 3D printing and injection molding. So get an instant quote for your project right now at PCBWay.com. Hello and welcome to the Retro Hour podcast, episode number 371, your weekly dose of retro gaming and technology news with me, Dan Wood. Me, Ravi Abbott. And me, Joe Fox. And a very warm welcome to this week's show, our final one of March, well into 2023 now, and so much happening in the world of retro gaming and technology to bring you up to speed on. That's what we do on the show. Every single Friday, a brand new episode drops, and it is fair to say this show is a, it's a show of two halves, isn't it? We update you on what's been happening in the world of retro. And then the second half of the podcast, this is a bit we really look forward to, when we welcome on a veteran of the industry to give us basically their life and career story. Yeah, and uh, this week we've got Rob Cunningham. And Rob worked on the series Homeworld. Now, Homeworld is is one of those titles. Uh, you need to think about 1997, which was the time period that it started to develop ended up coming out in 1999. In that world of 1997, you know, they had not many hardware accelerated graphics cards. There was a a, a kind of style that went with RTS and uh, these strategy games where a lot of them were 2D, a lot of them were flat. You know, they, they had mini maps in them. Well, Homeworld totally flipped that on its head and created a 3D real-time strategy. So it had a full space environment, um, they, they had, you know, memory limitations, polygon limitations, but they managed to really push it. And Rob was the art director of that. So Homeworld is absolutely fantastic, amazing. You may remember it because you may have seen some of the footage of it back in the days with that wonderful classical music and amazing soundtrack. And it was uh, published by Sierra Studios as well. So this is all about the kind of relationship with Sierra Studios, creating that 3D RTS and that kind of standard of space games, which has gone on to, you know, many modern titles at the moment. Well, that's the thing, Homeworld, I mean, it's still a massive franchise. I mean, Homeworld 3 is only a couple of months away now, isn't it? That's yeah, it's about to up. drop. That that was also delayed, but that's uh, coming out. And you know what? They, they do it right when they release these titles. So I don't mind that it's been delayed, but there's been a <laughs> lot of hype about it. And they've also done a remaster and uh, a prequel recently as well. Yeah, so uh, it's going to be a really interesting chat. I'm just thinking, we need to ask Rob how many uh, voodoo graphics cards he thinks at Homeworld <laughs> sold back in the day, because I imagine there's quite a lot of them flying off the shelf just for that game. So uh, Rob Cunningham of uh, Relic, all about the Homeworld series, those early games. He'll be our special guest on the show in around half an hour from now. Now, before we jump into what's been happening in the world of retro from over the last week, we're off to Manchester, our kid. God, a couple of <laughs> So I should have left the impressions to Ravi. You know, does <laughs> I can only do Liverpool. <laughs> so, uh, well, we are excited about this because we're basically going to be going to um, a gaming social party. Now, this is an event that's called Format, and it's happening on Thursday, the 25th of May. Um, goes on until around two o'clock in the morning. So, you know, this is going to be quite a party. And really, the idea is um, that basically a bunch of people from the gaming community, retro, modern, some of the best companies in gaming as well, we all get together have a bit of a networking event, a few drinks, a bit of a chat, and it just looks like it's going to be a nice little party, this. Yeah, it seems to be like aimed at the kind of retro gaming scene, the the modern gaming scene, but also the, the kind of nightlife scene. And, you know, we've started to see arcades and everything popping up all over the place at the moment. So, uh, you know, Ret Arcade Club UK is going to be there. There's going to be uh, some big names as well, like Ubisoft, and it, it looks really exciting. 
Yeah, and I know um, Joe's already getting ready to uh, get his uh, his Apple Newton out to make some contacts on the <laughs> night for the podcast. You know what? I really like this because it just seems like a no-brainer. You know, it's a gaming event, which, you know, we absolutely love, but it's based around going out and the nightlife and having a few drinks, which always kind of happens when you go to these big gaming events, you know, like Play Expo and Blackpool and stuff like that. But they're actually making it, you know, as part of the part, you know, the evening part of it. So, you know, you're welcome to have a drink and get drunk and mingle with everybody and stuff like that, which I really, really love that concept. I'm surprised it's not been done sooner. Yeah, to be fair, you know, whenever we go to events, that's always a bit, always a bit I look forward to the yeah. after party, to be honest. So <laughs> yeah. It is good that it is going to be just the after party bit. So there's going to be uh, more than 23 game studio headliners there as well. Uh, three floors of video games that you can play in game studios. You can meet your favourite content creators, loads of YouTubers and Twitch streamers are going to be there. Us guys will be there. Amazing food and drink, prize giveaways. Um, so a really good place just to kind of mingle with the community as well. And you know, whenever we go to events, we always, uh, we're a bit cheeky. We ask for a bit of a discount for our listeners. So we've actually got you if you want to come along to format in manchester there is a 25 percent discount code that you can use on checkout um, i'll put that in our show notes but basically if you enter frm underscore mcr25 you'll get 25 percent off the ticket price so i'll link everything you need to know up in the show notes at the retrohour.com and on your podcast app and hopefully we'll see you there in manchester on thursday 25th of may for a couple of drinks right then let's get into uh, this week's news now um we keep saying whenever we talk about the Nintendo Switch. Because I know Ravi's still kind of umming and erring about getting a Switch. I've, I've got my Wii U. It's still, <laughs> I'm still pretending <laughs> that's a Switch. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, it does just seem like more and more the Switch is becoming the go-to retro gaming platform. I mean, I was having a bit of a play on mine earlier on today, you know, a bunch of new Super Nintendo games on there. Some more of the um, Game Boy Advance games have appeared in the last couple of weeks too. So there's so much retro on that platform. But it turns out there could be even more with this brand new uh, project, which is called Egg. Yeah, this this is a... I, I, I'm, I could get this wrong, but, you know, hopefully you guys can help me along the way with this one. So Project Egg is being brought to us by D4 Enterprises and was revealed earlier this week that they're going to be aiming to bring a lot of kind of, I don't want to say lost Japanese games, but a lot of like Japanese games that we've we've not really seen on modern platforms or in the West. So, you know, games from the MSX, the PC-98 and the Neo Geo, they're going to bring them under the title of Project Egg, which stands for Engrossing Game Gallery. So it's a nice. networking, you know, like uh, a like a streaming kind of service, but for old arcade games and you know japanese msx games and stuff but on the switch um so it kind of brings it to a newer audience and a wider audience which i think is really cool they've already been doing it on pc for a while um and you know to great success and they have a relationship with nintendo already because of d4 enterprises actually brought a lot of um, neo geo games to the virtual console on the wii and the wii u such as like metal slug and the fatal fury series and stuff like that but it's all kind of like it's been announced, but it's been announced that they're trying to do it. Does that make sense? It seems, and it's in Japanese as well, the announcement, if you try to yeah, get the website. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's basically, it seems like the digital storefront um, has already been operating and mm. is all in Japanese. So I'm guessing this is a, a an interface for the Switch, which is going to bring it, you know, to the Western audience yeah. in, in in the style of like Antstream or something. But the yeah. um, thing I love about this is these are a lot of systems you know, that I've never played on in my life. Mm, you know, MSX, uh, you've got the X68K, you've got the PC88 and uh, uh, 98, which I've never, never really touched or explored those libraries. So, you know, if you if you sign up for this service, I'm, I'm sure you'll be able to get a huge amount of titles with it. And if it's already been established as well, I think, you know, um, they're probably going to have good experience of, you know, delivering this digitally and having this in a high quality with like no yeah. lag and all of those stuff. Have you tried any streaming services on the, um, on the switch yourself? I I've only tried Nintendo's own one, you know, with the, uh, which has, it isn't really streaming. You download the games, if I remember rightly, you know, the, yeah. the mega drive games and the super Nintendo games and stuff like that. So I've not don't, I've not done any sort of streaming on my switch or anything like that, but it is a little powerhouse. You know, it, it I, I've, I've always been quite impressed with what the Switch can do. And obviously these are retro games, but, you know, if this does come to the West, I think, you know, Dan's completely right. He's hit the nail on the head. The Switch, even though it's a modern console, is just absolutely amazing for retro. It is just such a go-to retro console at the moment. And I think this will just cement it even more. 
I think as well the fact that this D4 Enterprise, because originally when I saw this, I thought, is it going to be something like, because we, we've talked about kind of web-based kind of main platforms, mm. you know, where you put your own ROMs and that kind of thing in there. But it looks like these are actually, you know, official, apparently they're the sole worldwide distributor of MSX Licensing Corporation. Okay. So, you know, it's all official and above board. Um, and obviously they've got that track record of doing them well on the virtual console on the Wii. Yeah, I was looking um, at the, the, the Wii U version. So I'm assuming those are the MSX games that were on there and they were just perfect. You know, that that was a great way to explore the library. Yeah, because I mean, that's the thing we've talked about, kind of, you know, the PC Engine Mini and stuff like that. And I, I like mini consoles. I don't own many of them. I like the idea of them. And in fact, it was kind of like, you know, the, the Turbo Graphics Mini and stuff like that, where they were probably going to appeal to me a bit more than something like the Mega Drive Mini, because it's a platform that I haven't played before. And I'm not familiar with the, you know, these like real Japanese localized game libraries. But if they're going to end up bringing just kind of all these services to the Switch, I'm like... The Switch can kind of do it all now, can't mm-hmm. it? You, know, you don't really need to buy many I consoles. I guess the biggest problem is going to be translation and hopefully getting that yeah. all all done correctly. You know, I'm, yeah. I'm sure they will, but um, I can imagine if they're trying to hit, you know, a worldwide audience or different re- regions, they might have to translate into different languages as well. So that's going to yeah. be a big task for them to, you know, go through every single title. And may- maybe there's versions that they could put in that are, are already translated and already done. Yeah, they're just to clarify at the moment, they haven't said it's coming to the West at all. You know, there's no kind of, they haven't revealed any plans to do that. But I think, I mean, it's often complicated doing that kind of thing because of, if they own the worldwide licensing, I guess that's going to help them a lot because that's normally a problem, isn't it? You know, whether they can do it in different regions and make changes to the game code, like you said, then to change them into English language. But if they um, if they have the rights to do that, I mean, it would make sense. So I think there is interest because, you know, retro gaming now, I mean, I'd say I've been a retro gamer if you like, for about, I mean, I started playing Spectrum games on my Amiga and, you know, GameCube, uh, Game Gear games back in the late 90s and stuff. So I've probably been a retro gamer for around 25 years, you know, with a bit of a break. But I kind of feel like I've explored most of the library of systems that we got in, like, the West. So it kind of feels like I'm, I'm ready for something new that I'm totally unfamiliar with now. It makes sense for them to use that base of users that are already there that you know yeah. already have switches and that are, mm. they're into that ecosystem just you know address that and then it's it's a it's a goal really you know they can just score straight away <laughs> with that and it feels like a new console as well it's cool because i mean i love the mega drive games and that on the switch but i'm kind of at the stage now after 30 years where i could probably play sonic the hedgehog 2 blindfolded yeah and that's not a challenge, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'm, no YouTube videos coming I, out of that. I know we keep saying it's a no-brainer, but the fact that they even say, you know, they want to bring these games, you know, to a new audience and a wider yeah. audience. So bringing it to the West, I think it's got to be done. But, you know, like you guys both say, it's just whether they can, you know, some of these games might not have English translations and stuff like that. So it just depends mm. how big of an undertaking it is. But either way, even if it doesn't, I still think it's very cool, you know, bringing these kind of like obscure consoles to, you know, modern gamers. Yeah, absolutely. So we'll keep an eye on that. Project Egg, uh, there is a video and a, a website in Japanese if you want to check it out and a, a nice article on Nintendo Life that I'll link up in our show notes and on your podcast app as well. Head to the retrohour.com. I did talk about playing Mega Drive games over and over again, but, you know, there are, of course, new Mega Drive games that come out all the time. If you're a Mega Drive gamer, it's actually been a pretty good couple of years for new titles on that platform and some very impressive looking games coming to the mega drive and uh, i'm going to say ravi's favorite word now because it does seem to be the uh, the retro gaming genre that's really in vogue right now it is a roguelike game ravi a new one that's coming to the mega drive planet b yeah it, it looks exciting this one does i like the um uh, procedural kind of random generation in there that they have which is gonna you know make the game last a lot longer um, it looks interesting. What do you think, Joe? I'm not really an expert in sh- genre, as you know already. <laughs> yeah, none, none of us seem to be, but it needs to be. It seems to be the new genre, roguelike. Um, I think it looks cool. I think, um, I think graphically, they've nailed it. I mean, it's the Mega Drive. You know, you can't you can't go too wrong with the Mega Drive. But I think graphically, uh, they've nailed it. That pixel look, um, and I love the soundtrack. We've only got a 45 second. 45 second trailer at the moment but it it really reminded me of echo the dolphin the soundtrack did and then the Mm. look of it reminded me of the old fantasy star games but it kind of meets zelda for the super nintendo a link to the past that's kind of the look of it it kind of reminded me of it's Um, just a blasting blasting the synth like yeah 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 (laughs) yeah, yeah, absolutely 
Uh, but it's got that gritty, gritty Mega Drive sound. Yeah, it's got that gritty Mega Drive sound and that gritty Mega Drive look. There's not not been much said about it, um, other than that it's been made by a developer called Overrated Future, um, um, which kind of sets the tone really because the game is set in like an apocalyptic wasteland, and you know it looks like you're trying to survive, and you know, like you say, it's kind of a bit of like a dungeon crawler, randomly generated, but you're going through like derelict buildings and you know, like the vast apocalypse wasteland by the looks of things, which is just a genre I absolutely love. If they have been answering some questions in the comments section of the YouTube page of the YouTube video they've put out and they have confirmed, they have confirmed it will be coming out in cartridge as well. So it will be coming to a Mega Drive cartridge, which I think is really cool. So you will be able to play that on, you know, original hardware, not through an EverDrive, which I think is really, really cool. And they do mention as well in the trailer that it uses uh, blast processing. That kind of Ooh. pops up on the screen about 30 <laughs> seconds into it as well. Fantastic. There's no release date announced yet, but I love the fact, you know, you said the studio called Overrated Future. Um, it actually says in the uh, in the YouTube video, available in an overrated future nice. for the Sega Genesis and Mega Drive. So, um, yeah, it looks like early days on this one at the moment. And uh, But it just, you know, we, we talk about all the time how it is amazing. That, that just, it seems to be like certain systems that just get so much love. Mm-hmm. Like the Mega Drive feels like over the last couple of years. And, you know, the Dreamcast, which we're going to be talking about next week on the podcast, kind of feels like, the, you know, the Sega systems are really getting a lot of homebrew titles for them. Not so much the Saturn. I've got a feeling that might be a harder system to do homebrew for. Yeah, probably a harder system to, you know, to, to well, it was a hard system to program and develop for in the first place. Yeah. But yeah, there does seem to be a lot of love and, you know, there's more, it's weird, like more Mega Drive and Dreamcast games coming out in the last kind of five years than, you know, did in the last couple of years of their kind of like life cycle. You know, I know the Mega Drive went on for a long time and the Dreamcast was kind of cut off early. But there is definitely such a huge, huge fan base for it. And it's becoming, you know, the community, the communities of it is becoming so much more like welcoming to people trying to program for them and develop for them, it seems as well, which is really cool. I love the fact they're making these kind of commercial quality games as well. Because, mm. I mean, I was kind of looking before when, when I spotted this story, I wondered what the, the homebrew scene on like the Master System was like, for example. And um, there, there are a few great videos because they kind of do these um, these game jams, yeah. you know, for different systems. So there's a really good video by Retro Recollections um, on YouTube where they've got like a 10, 15 minute look at all the, um, basically the homebrew games that were entered into um, this competition called SMS Power. Uh, back in 2020. So um, but none of them kind of look up to the standard of like, you know, uh, what would have been classed as a AAA game like some of these indie studios are making. But it is cool to see that these different platforms have got their own kind of pockets of homebrew communities going on. So I think it will be nice though to see a few more kind of physical games and stuff coming out for systems like the the Master System and maybe the ones that don't get quite as much love. Yeah, that would be nice. I, I, now you've said the Sega Saturn, I feel like that's like a, a rabbit hole I want to go down and just see what's out there. Yeah. <laughs> probably get loads of tweets now. What do you mean there's like 50 games come out of it this year? Yeah, probably. Um, <laughs> you guys are idiots. So, uh, tell us about them if so. We'd love to see them. So uh, if you want to check out what we know about this uh, new Mega Drive game, Planet B, I'll put a link to the trailer in the show notes at theretrohour.com. Now, while the rest of the world is getting hyped for the new Mario movie that is due out in a couple of weeks' time, I know this is going to take you back a bit, Joe. Look at this. It's a plumber's nightmare. These pipes have been service for years. Must have been a non-union job. The original. And of course, you're going to say the best Mario movie, aren't the you? The best Mario movie. I was literally about to say that you took the words right out of my mouth. The best movie ever made, I think Joe would possibly it could say. quite possibly could be. <laughs> <laughs> well, it seems you're not alone in your love for the 1993 Super Mario Brothers movie that starred, of course, um, Bob Hoskins. And uh, I can never say his surname, John. Lizzie, How do you say is John? it Lizzie-owski? I can't say it. Les, Les, Les Gum, something I like can't that. remember. Mario and Luigi, yeah. anyway, <laughs> played, didn't they, back in the day. Uh, but it turns out, to celebrate 30 years of the original Mario movie, while everyone else is getting hyped for the new one, there's actually a museum exhibition that's been set up to celebrate the original film. I, I can't believe this hasn't been done sooner, to be perfectly honest, guys. I know, crazy. It's isn't crazy. It's going to be an annual event. Yeah, an annual I event. this is great. Yeah, this is... Um, <laughs> So this is, I think, uh, because of it, it's an American museum. Um, yeah. In the British museums that we have, like, you know, you've got the the big funded ones that have been held by government and stuff. And then you've got all these amazing museums as well that are done by collectors. And yeah. uh, they're, they're fantastic to see all these retro gaming museums pop up. But I always find that the ones that kind of have a bit of government funding or stuff tend to go for like the highbrow 
um, kind of stuff. And it's a bit like, oh, we won't do in a, a Mario exhibition. But um, <laughs> this is... Yeah, more academic kind of stuff, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it's all very academic. And and I know we, we kind of have a bit more of a computer culture as well here, but I, I don't see a, a British museum kind of doing something like this. Maybe one of the uh, ones set up privately... Uh, would do that but yeah it's this is great this is a a really cool exhibition and um this is based in the national video game museum in frisco in texas which mm. uh mm. you know if if you're in america this is well worth a visit yeah well this is running now um it opened on march 24th so been up in about a week when this podcast comes out as well it is a um a whole exhibit celebrating 30 years of the original Mario movie. And they've actually tweeted on this uh, Twitter account, Super Mario Brothers Inside the Pipe, kind of a few little um, images of what you could expect to see then. It looks like there's actually a massive selection of props from the original Mario movie. Yeah, so they've got like the boots and the guns and obviously they, they don't want to, you know, reveal too much, but they, by the looks of things, some of the costumes and a lot of like the posters, you know, kind of like, the you know, the media surrounding the release of it like the promotional art and stuff like that looks really really cool um i love that they have the big massive boots you know that bob hoskins wears at one point and the uh big birdo woman wears at sort of one point <laughs> in the film as well i love that they've got them um but i kind of like went down the rabbit hole of um smb inside the pipe and they're actually a dedicated like organization who are kind of like <laughs> dedicated to the behind the scenes and highlighting the artistry of the Super Mario Brothers movie, the 1993 one. Just the movie then they're, they're dedicated yeah, to. Yeah, like it's like a right. community who are like dedicated to the love of that movie. So, you know, maybe I uh, need to give them a follow and maybe hit them up. Cause yeah, I like- think this is cool. Like if, if you were going around and you were getting different movies and then kind of doing these, these exhibitions about it, I can imagine they could become touring pieces. Mm. So, yeah. you know, maybe they could come to the UK at one point and then a, a museum would like put them on. Or somewhere like the Science Museum or something. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, and I think that's really cool. And I just wonder what other video game movies could they do? They could, uh, the Street Fighter is going to be the obvious one, isn't it? <laughs> Mortal Kombat. The Mortal Kombat yeah. Museum. <laughs> How many, every Resident Evil film. Oh, God, um, <laughs> I'd avoid that one. <laughs> take up the whole museum. <laughs> Because as much as we kind of take the mickey out of the the Super Mario Brothers movie, the yeah, the original one, it was huge when it came out, and you know I went to see it at the cinema. You know, it was like it was definitely part of pop culture of the early nineties, and anyone that was a a Nintendo or a Mario fan went to see that film when it came out. Um, and, and I know there is going to be. I just imagine Joe wants to jump on a plane just to hope that the, the Goomba costumes are. I just want to try it. I love it. We've had this ongoing joke for like seven years. That's like my favorite film of all time. I'm not going to hop on a plane. But I think it's very cool. I think it's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> so maybe not quite worth the trip from the UK, but if you're near Texas, um, that is available now uh, to go and check out. So well, uh, I'll link that up in our show notes as well. Now, we do love covering our computery stuff on this podcast as well as the gaming things. And this one actually looks like it could be a very powerful expansion for your Commodore 64. Now, I do love how many new expansions come out, particularly for the old Commodore machines. I mean, we had our... Uh, our patrons hang out on Sunday night. And um, ever since then, I've been trying to find one of these really souped up Amiga accelerators that a few of the guys on there were talking about. So I managed to track one of them down now. I know Ravi's quite keen as well. Tell but me it does where. Feel like <laughs> <laughs> I'll drop you a link. Um, but yeah, I mean, there are, there's so many new expansions coming out all the time for retro systems. It's sometimes hard to keep up, but this one, we've kind of covered it before, but now it turns out using, of course, the power of the Raspberry Pi, which has just done wonders for retro computers. This is a really fantastic new cartridge, a full expansion for the Commodore 64 called the Radcart. Yeah, so so we did mention this before because we did a story about a Doom running on the on the C64 and that was using uh, the power of the Raspberry Pi. And um, this is basically an expansion card, but it gives you a, a CPU boost. And it also um, emulates RAM as well. So it emulates the RAM expansion. And the way that it works is uh, it uses a Raspberry Pi. So basically you can put any Raspberry Pi in there and it will emulate it. So um, the, the the models it supports are the old 3A, uh, 3B and 0W as well, which is one of the smaller ones. Um, it's pretty amazing though. It's... <laughs> 
it could do 16 meg of RAM, which is... Uh, For a Commodore 64 is insane. Yeah, which is absolutely insane. And uh, it also has MIDI support in there, which which I find really interesting as well. So, you know, they've got Doom running on there, of course, as like, a, you know, a proof of concept. And uh, uh, the, the, the machine's actually... The CPU on the uh, Raspberry Pi is handling the power and uh, doing all the kind of processing, and then it gets put through the C64 and displayed. Um, I'm just wondering what other titles they could put on this, and uh, it's nice to see as well that they've got some 3D printed cases for it, and it's it's kind of becoming a, a, a bit of a all in one product. Well, I'm looking at this video um, that I'll put in our show notes as well. I'm going to see a bit more about kind of what the the rad expansion can do. It's on a YouTube channel called Emulathor, and it shows Doom running on this on the Commodore 64. And that frame rate, it, it is a solid 50 frames a second. Yeah, yeah. And, and I know, like you said, the Raspberry Pi is doing like the CPU horse work, but it's still pushing it through the Commodore 64's VIC-2 chip um, in, you know, 16 colours, 320 by 200 pixels. Um, even got, you know, even, even the SID chip, you know, the, the audio is coming by the SID chip as well. So I think this is a great achievement, and it looks like a really playable version. Yeah, of it's Doom that's it running on this more playable than the Amiga version, to be honest. Oh, yeah. Like you know, on an unexpanded Amiga, it's uh, is is pretty insane. And I'm just thinking, like, what the capabilities are going to be like when people develop some more software to support this stuff, like you know, videos being played on their YouTube. <laughs> um, there's going to be all sorts, especially if you're got the ability to uh, hook it up online as well. Um, yeah, it's got got no limits, this uh, card. I think it's uh, really interesting. And and the fact that it's on sale now is fantastic. We'll drop a link uh, for a pre-built board in the show notes. Yeah, and I've seen people kind of doing stuff like, I think it was a 1541 Ultimate 2 card that I saw the retro computer guys from Leicester using once, and they were playing like uh, movies on the Commodore 64 in 16 colours. That blew my mind when I saw that about 10 years ago. But the fact that this is using commodity hardware that's widely available, you know, the the Raspberry Pi, which, you know, (laughs) I think at one point, I wonder how many, you know, what's going to be the most Raspberry Pis we can actually fit inside a retro machine? (laughs) Because they're just taking over jobs of every other chip in there now, aren't they? Which I know some people, there are purists out there that are like, well, you know, it's not the same as having an original chip in there. And of course, there is no point in doing this apart from because you can. Yeah, yeah. And also, like, it's not expensive. Um, you know, yeah. you know, it's it's nineteen euros here. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Well, that is a lot cheaper than you know the custom um, expansions that I remember seeing a few years ago. Yeah. That often they Th- get into that, the that's for like the bare ba- bare bones one, and then you know you can get like a a, a kind of three D printed thing on top, and of course you've got to get the Raspberry Pi and put it in there. But still, I think that's a bargain. You know, for yeah. for what you're getting and the power. You know, it's it's crazy. I remember stuff like the. Uh, super cpu for the commodore 64 that uh, got really expensive back in the days yeah and even using you know pi storm on the amiga where you can put a raspberry pi inside your your amiga 1200 or your 500 and you know kind of use that as a souped up accelerator if you were to buy an actual accelerator that could do those speeds i mean god you're talking thousands of pounds i remember day, i went but- years ago to nova demo party and they had a, a guy with a bbc and he he plugged a raspberry pi into the bbc and that was the first time i've been seen it used as like a co-processor and i was like this is insane and i just thought somehow in my head that it was just going to stick within the bbc world but uh it's great to see all these other machines benefiting and even though there are the purists out there i think you know if if this hardware is cheap and it's inside your machine and it feels the same then what's the difference and and it's fun as well it's a fun thing to do you know to be able to run that on 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 the old machine that you love Yes, I've got a feeling I may be ordering one of those when we finish recording tonight, Ravi. They look very cool. Now, we did talk about um, Sonic Origins, of course, um, that collection of classic remastered old-school Sonic the Hedgehog games that came out, when was that, about a year ago now? Did Sonic Origins yeah, come out? Yeah, it was about a year ago. I think, I think it was last year. It might have been, was it the year before? No, I think it was last year. Summer last year. What kind of merges sure. into one after yeah, a while? Yeah, it does, doesn't, doesn't it? it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but now there is a, a great new expansion as well. Well, actually, this is kind of a, it's a version of the game that you can either buy standalone or for $10, you can buy an expansion for the original Sonic Origins. And this is called Sonic Origins Plus, and it adds a bunch of new Game Gear titles. Yeah, so uh, it's just come back to me now. It was it was June 23rd, because that's Sonic's birthday, and it was part of his yes. 30th birthday celebrations, even though it was the 31-year anniversary. 
Um, yeah, the ongoing 30th party. The of ongoing Prince 30th party. It, I, I, this might be part of it as well, because this comes out on June 23rd as well. Should be his 32nd <laughs> birthday. Um, but yeah, Sonic Origin Plus. So Origins Plus. So if you don't already have Origins, it'll be $40 and you'll get Origins Plus all these extra games. If you already own it, it'll be a $10 DLC. And not only does it come with all the Game Gear games, it also makes Amy playable. You know, the pink hedgehog who's, you know, Sonic's like love interest playable in the Origin games that you already get. So Sonic 1, 2, 3, Sonic and Knuckles and Sonic CD, which mm. I think a lot of people were disappointed she wasn't playable in those games because of, in there's a lot of like anime, you know, like they kind of like made Sonic Origins like a story that linked all four of those original games together. And Amy's like in the clips, you know, like in the cut scenes by, in between. And I remember complaints that you couldn't play her, actually. Yeah, yeah and people yeah. complained you couldn't play as her. So she's part of this DLC. It makes her playable, which I think is very cool. Um, and like you say, you get all the Game Gear games. And it kind of like, I knew there was a lot of Sonic Game Gear games, but I'm about to read the list out now. And it really kind of puts it into uh, perspective. So let, let me get this right, though. It's, it's not... F- Obviously, it's not for the Game Gear, it's for the PS5 and PS4 yes, but it, yes, and the Xbox yeah. new ones. But it's for the Origins pack that came yeah, out last year. But, yeah, yeah, but yeah. it has those games within it then. That's correct, yeah. Because so, I was looking yeah. at this thinking, ooh, all the Game Gear games <laughs> for my yeah. Game Gear, but um, no. No, it's, no. It's so it, it's, okay. it's for modern consoles, you know, Steam and PS5 and stuff like you say. Um, so you spot on there to make it clear. Um, so we kind of win at that. Is that you already know what Sonic Origins was? So Sonic Origins was a pack for modern consoles, and it was a re-release, kind of like a I don't want to say HD re-release because that's been done so many times. But they kind of like put a story in there and made it so like Tails and Knuckles was playable in all the games as well as Sonic, which I thought was like a really nice little you know little little charm to it there. And it kind of like, you could play it in original mode, so you just play Sonic 1 and Sonic 2, or you could play it as like one big story where it just went through as one big game, which is what I did, which I thought was really and cool. And I think the idea of it was, that, you know, after the after the movie came out, it was a way to get new fans into the old games. Yeah. That was kind of the idea behind it. Yeah, yeah. So this Origins Plus now gives you the Game Gear game. So like I say, you get Sonic the Hedgehog, Sonic the Hedgehog 2, Sonic Chaos, Sonic the Hedgehog Triple Trouble, Sonic Labyrinth, Sonic Blast, Sonic Drift, Sonic Drift 2, Sonic 2 in 1, Tails Adventure, Tails Sky Patrol, and Sonic Spinball for the Game Gear in this new pack. So, I don't know how many games that was, but it kind of puts into perspective how many Game Gear Sonic games there was. You know, I knew- I haven't heard of half of them. Yeah, I, no, I, I, I think they need to make a, a multi card for the Game Gear yeah, that has yeah. them all on. <laughs> that would be a good idea. But yeah, and as well as that, you do get Amy as the playable character as well in the original Sonic games for Sonic Origins, which uh, I think is really cool. Um, and like I say, I think it's cool that it's only $10 if you already got Sonic Origins and you get, what, like eight, nine games there. It's interesting though, because I remember when Origins came out last year, I was, just before I went on holiday, I was, I, I didn't, I didn't actually get it though, I don't think. I remember I was about to buy it, then I saw some quite bad reviews about it. And yeah. And it kind of put me off. But then since I've seen, it's been very mixed, hasn't it? I've seen some people give it like... 10% and other reviews that give it 90%. So it feels like it was quite a, a I, mixed I reception. Didn't, I didn't have a problem with it. I waited for it. I got it over Christmas and I got it for about £16, uh, half mm. price, I think it was, like, you know, as part of like the winter sale. Um, and I thoroughly enjoyed replaying through them all. And I, for like a week every night, you know, picked up and played the next Sonic kind of thing. And I really, I actually really enjoyed it. Um, it. It was really jarring on Sonic 3 because I'm so familiar with the Sonic games that certain levels had different soundtracks and kind of realising how many Michael Jackson was involved with, you know, yeah. was like, I think it was, there's about three or four zones on there. I think it's the fairground, the fairground level, the ski level, and then the, the last level. The, so the kind of the last three levels and then a few in Sonic and Knuckles were changed as well. I don't know if that was because of Michael, the Michael Jackson thing, but that was probably my only gripe with it because they didn't have the licenses to it, etc. But so many like reviews seem to really jump on that and really kind of stampede it as like it's a terrible game because it's missing like three tracks, and you're just mm. like, which is beyond their control, I guess. Yeah, you know, Michael Jackson to stay probably earns it. Yeah, exactly. And then also a lot of people jump on the fact like how many times you're going to re-release these games or re-release them in one place, which I understand. Yeah. But you know, as you just said, it's bringing those games to like a modern audience and it's bringing it to like the young generation who have gone and seen the films and absolutely love Sonic now, 
you know, one of my best friends, his little boy who's seven or eight, he loves Sonic 1 and 2, absolutely loves it. And he's probably never played the originals and they have an Xbox One. So it's a good way of them, you know, of him downloading them from Sun and saying, oh, look, you know, without him having to go, you know, like I say, there's loads of different ways to play it. You know, they've come out on every single console since the Mega Drive, but they've only got an Xbox One because of they're one of those families who just get the next console and give away the old one or whatever. Do you know what I mean? And I like that it's just $10 if you've got Mm. the original, um, you know, Sonic Origins, you know, just $10 to upgrade, which is uh, uh, really good for all of those games. Yeah, 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 definitely. And they upgraded them as well, you know, new widescreen format, and it's got like, um, you know, some of the moves in there. I think the... uh, was it the drop spin from Sonic Mania? I remember reading was in there too. Yeah, that's, so yeah. it was. It's kind of more modernised it for mm. you know modern players, I guess. You know that kind of removes a lot of the limitations of the original. So I mean, I'm trying to think though, did I get it? I think I may have bought it on my Switch, just never played it or something. I don't know. I'm going to have to have a look. It wouldn't surprise me if I'd done that because um, we we're talking <laughs> the other day when I came around Joe's house. I've still got games from the PlayStation Three that are in their shrink wrap that I haven't played yet. <laughs> that's just being an adult. It's just you know life gets yeah. in the way. I've I've had Resident Evil 4 since Friday. We're now on, what day is it? Tuesday. And you know me, massive Resident Evil fan. And I mean, I've played it. Don't get me wrong. I've stayed up playing it late, but I'm nowhere near completing it. And I'm just like, what's happened to me? (laughs) When you're a teenager, you'd have finished it on the first day. Yeah, well, even as an adult, you know, on the last remakes, I finished them in the first day, but it hasn't happened this time. But I think it's just, you know, the passage of time, you know, other things get in the way, unfortunately. (laughs) But... Yeah, I would not be surprised if you've you've probably already got Origins Plus downloaded down. It's not out until June twenty <laughs> third. <Yeah, no>, no. <laughs> so it might spur me to give it a play if I have bought it already. So uh, yeah, if you do want to get that, um, I'll link that up. And of course, everything else we talk about, you find them all in our show notes. You don't have to Google around or anything. Just check your podcast app or head to theretrohour.com. dot com. Just quickly before we get into our chat with uh, Rob Cunningham, this week's special guest, um, just a quick reminder that theretrohour.com is also the place that you can head to if you would like to join our wonderful patrons community now we did have our, our most recent hangout um the weekend just gone so there is another one of those coming up in a couple of weeks time end of the month we do it last sunday of every month 8 p.m till 10 p.m uk time luckily um even though the clocks changed in the early hours of sunday <laughs> yeah. morning and i completely didn't realize that my, my missus woke me up and it was like 11 o'clock it's, it's all morning, automatic like, now i always have one clock in the house that isn't and it's usually the oven and yeah, mine was out of date for like <laughs> half a year. I was, I was like, why have I slept in so late? She goes, the clock's been forward. I'm like, oh, right, didn't realise. But luckily, everyone did make it onto the patron hangout in time. We had a great little chat this weekend. A few new faces that joined us too. Um, we talked about all kinds of stuff on the hangout. I mean, the subjects are so varied now, aren't they? Yeah, we ended up talking about South Park and uh, ChatGPT, which yeah. I, you know was really interesting. We were all kind of giving our thoughts on that and stuff. And of course showing off our retro collections and talking about retro games and stuff like that. But we always end up, you know, kind of like down different rabbit holes and stuff like that or end up on just tech in general or films. And I was really worried as well, you know, about the uh, the time change because only about five, six people jumped on, you know, when I first, you know, when we first kind of booted it up at eight o'clock. But within five, ten minutes, you know, there's 30, 40 people on there, which just absolutely yeah. blows my mind that, you know, people not only support the show, but then want to come on, and chat with us and stuff like that and get involved in the community. So, and, you know, it has a real community culture to it now, which I absolutely love. Yeah, new people are welcome all the time. I mean, we had a few new faces. Pretty pretty much every hangout we get, we get a Mm. bunch of new people coming on for the first time. And it's a really welcoming community. So uh, we'd love to see you there. If you join us on Patreon, of course, you're going to get an invite to it at the end of April. And uh, for our gold members and above, we've actually just recorded possibly the most controversial episode of our uh, bonus podcast, the Retro Hour After Hours, episode 33, where uh, we went all piratey on you. Yeah, yeah, we, we were discussing piracy throughout the ages. And um, yeah, it was it was interesting. I had to watch myself so I didn't incriminate myself. But, um, it, <laughs> yeah, Ravi hasn't got to jail yet. Yeah, it's been no, it, it was really good, though, all of our different experiences and also all the different formats and quite a few interesting debate points about, like, did... Naps to help lead to iTunes, and you know, there's there's a lot of interesting conversations you can have around piracy. Yeah, we talked about you know even stuff like cart to floppy copiers on the Super Nintendo and the Mega Drive, X copy on the Amiga, IRC. Stores and stuff back in the day. Or yeah, so it was about an hour and a half discussion 
Um, all about piracy, a lot of our memories about it as well. Like, like Ravi said, quite a bit of debate in there too. We all had, you know, varying opinions on stuff. So it was a really interesting episode. And if you join us as a gold member or above, you can not only get the latest episode, but you'll unlock the previous 32 episodes of the After Hours as well. So lots of listening there. And of course, the main reason that you're joining us on Patreon is that just to support this podcast and make sure that we can keep bringing out new episodes every single Friday. So thank you so much for your support. Right, then next, going inside Homeworld with this week's special guest, Rob Cunningham. He's coming up next on the Retro Hour podcast. You're listening to the Retro Hour podcast, and it's time to welcome on this week's very special guest. And we're so excited to talk to our guest this week, an original founding member of Relic Entertainment, the art director for the cult classic Homeworld as well. Let's welcome on Rob Cunningham. How are you doing, Rob? I'm very well, thanks. How are you, sir? Very good, thank you. And uh, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. We're really excited to uh, hear some of your stories about your uh, many experiences in the industry. Um, but kind of taking it you know, back to day one, I mean, let's, let's go all the way back. What kind of got you into gaming originally then? Do you remember where it all started, your your first ever experience of video games? I do, yeah. Um, you know, to be honest, it was, let's see, 96. And uh, <laughs> I was a, uh, a freelance artist at the time, uh, working out of Vancouver, and, mm. you know, could barely make rent and, you know, typical, you know, 20-something story. And um, I was teaching at a school for animation and video game programming called DigiPen back in the day. And one of my students was Alex Garden, who wasn't much younger than me. I mean, we were all quite young at the time. And um, one day he literally just came up and said, hey, do you want to start a video game company with me? And, and I was like, sure, you know, why not? <laughs> so me and Alex and the four other guys um, got together and started relic entertainment and um it sort of took off and it was uh pretty life-changing for all of us at that time were you a games player yourself were you a video gamer before that well you know sort of but you got to remember it was you know it was early mid 90s so you know video games were sort of crap at the time you know i mean they were all right there were some cool ones i remember playing command and conquer and red alert and you know watching other people play doom because you know mad 3d environment would sort of make me nauseous <laughs> But um, yeah, you know, there wasn't that. You know, I was sort of into it, but not not you know crazy about it. I w- I was um, watching an interview with you, and you mentioned that you'd worked on an RTS title uh, previously, which uh, you could you could kind of see through buildings on that one. Uh, what was that title? Yeah, so that was a that was a short term gig I had just before um, Alex and me and the guys started Relic. It was you know I was working with those guys for a couple of months that summer. And yeah, I mean, it was pretty much the same as Command and Conquer, only the buildings were a bit bigger. You know, the little sprites for the buildings were a bit bigger. And when you sent units into the buildings, the roof would sort of disappear and you'd see guys, you know, working at consoles and stuff. It was it was pretty cool. But what what was that um, called? uh, That was a company called Fearless Games. And I can't even remember. I don't think it even had a title at the time. It was never released. It was never released. (laughs) Well, what what got you into um, art and, and drawing and like who who were your kind of influences and inspiration? Wow, yeah. So, well, I've always been into drawing since I can remember, and um, you know, I always loved the the work of you know Sid Mead and the artists in the Star Wars franchise, um, the storyboard artists, the pre production artists, and I was really drawn to that kind of illustration and conceptual art as opposed to fine art and so you know in my you know I guess early 20s I thought to myself well you know I love drawing and I love I love you know making pictures and drawing spaceships and you know stuff like that and I love these movies that have this this great sort of you know futuristic visualization or or art direction and um you know, so at the time I thought, you know, I got to get into movies. I got to start doing storyboards and, you know, get into, into, you know, film pre-production visualization. And then that sort of, you know, brought me to Vancouver and, and led me sort of by accident really into the video game business. I, th- I think it was pretty crazy. You know, you mentioned that uh, your, your students had actually asked you about, um, you know, founding Relic and like creating a company. How how quickly did that you know turn into an actual company, and uh, 
what was the kind of like turnaround like? Were, were you working collaboratively before, or had you not um, even worked together? Um, the the founding group of Relic had never worked together, but as a group, um, I think Alex and Luke had worked together, and uh, I think Alex and Aaron Cambitz had worked together, and Aaron Daly. So I think you know we had sort of you know they had worked together, you know here and there. I think at Radical and EA. Um, but as a group, we had never done anything together before. Indeed, when Alex said, Hey, let's, let's start this company. I think we all went to his place for pizza on a Friday and met for the first time. And then it was like a week later or something, we were all heading down to Seattle to, to pitch the Homeworld concept, um, to Scott Lynch, who was at Sierra at the time. And, um, yeah, I mean, the, you know, it was a Saturday there was no one there. Scott was supposed to have a partner there, but he couldn't show up. So we were all thinking, you know, that's not going to happen. Then we went into the pitch and, you know, Alex was, you know, making sound effects with his mouth and like wiggling his hands around doing the spaghetti ball, you know, pitching Homeworld. And uh, <laughs> we showed him a bunch of art. Me and, me and Aaron Campbell showed him a bunch of art that we had done for previous stuff. And the, and the pitch was over and, and we were sort of standing around in the parking lot and, Scott gave Alex a ring and said, you guys are greenlit. Let's, let's make this game. So, you know, wow. it was sort of amazing. And then I think about, you know, like a month later, we had a bunch of money and rented an office above a nightclub in Vancouver. And next thing you know, we're making Homeworld. That must have been quite the ride, you know, that, that, <laughs> just all that happening in a couple of weeks' time. Oh, it was mad. Like, were, you, were, were you aware of Sierra Studios' history? And how, how did you kind of approach them then? How did they get on your radar? Well, Alex knew Scott from before, and I can't remember, I don't remember how he knew him. I think it was, I think he did a gig at EA for a bit, and I think Alex was sort of friends with Don Matrick at the time, and I can't remember what the what the connection was there, but he knew he knew Scott, and I had no, I'd never heard of Sierra. So, yeah, it was uh, it was pretty sudden. It was pretty crazy. I, I, I read that you were kind of doing sketches in the car on the way there and stuff. And uh, Yeah, well, we, we weren't actually sketching in the car, but we were showing each other's drawings. Like me and me and Aaron Cambitz drove down together. I was driving and, and uh, sh- literally showing each other our art for the first time. I'd never seen his art before and he'd never seen mine. And, you know, we're just we're heading south on the 99 and, and in, Interstate 5 down into Washington State, like handing paper back and forth in the, uh, while I'm trying to drive. And I just was blown away. I mean, the guy is an incredible artist. And I just thought, my God, you know, this guy is is just awesome. I can't wait to, you know, work with this guy. So, yeah, so Nick- but we weren't we weren't actually drawing in the car while it was moving. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it was, that'd be quite difficult. Uh, I on a state of surface. <laughs> it was, it was um, tricky enough just looking at pictures while driving. Yeah. I, w- I was wondering when when the idea of Homeworld actually then came together. Was it in the meeting or was it something you'd discussed before? Or Well, I think Alex had brainstormed the idea of a 3D RTS in space, uh, you know, like a sci-fi RTS in space. There was sort of a mashup of um, Command and Conquer play mechanics with a sort of Battlestar Galactica uh, story-ish and a sort of, you know, Star Wars cinematic quality. And, you know, that all sounded awesome. You've got to remember as well, this is like 1996. So, you know, nothing like that was even remotely out there. And, um, and I, I can't remember where the idea came from at first. I think Alex had brainstormed it with a friend of his. I think it was, it might have been Greg McMartin. I can't remember. But, um, you know, he, he still had this idea in his head and, and that's pretty much how he pitched it to us all. You know, he was like, it's Command and Conquer meets Battlestar Galactica. And then he'd do the hand hand wiggling and, you know, sound effects and we'd all be fully on board, you know. Because for, for, for the RTS genre, there was stuff like uh, Dune before and uh, a few previous titles and then like um, Supreme Commander as well was, was yeah. one that was kind of out at the time. But you're right, there was nothing set in space or, or in that kind of sci-fi world. Yeah, I mean the big the big idea, you know, the big innovation was this w- was you know being in space. We didn't have to deal with terrain. We didn't have to deal with a, a you know a surface, um, which was super exciting to us, but also mega challenging. So we had this crazy camera we had to design and implement. Um, but yeah, you're right. I mean, there were a couple of games out here. Obviously, Dune Two was before that, and you know, Command and Conquer and Red Alert, Supreme Commander, um, you know, but all of them were very much. I think Supreme Commander might have actually been 3D, 
technically, but there was nothing like the the 3D sort of mad zoomy orbital camera that that Homeworld had. But obviously, 3D graphics were you know the really really cool thing back then. You know, I remember people rushing out to buy graphics cards just to play games like Homeworld. Yeah. And- you know, other games around at the time, they were actually selling hardware. I mean, what were kind of the, the struggles to add that extra dimension in an RTS game, you know, going from what was traditionally a 2D genre to the third dimension? Yeah, I mean, like you said, you know, in those days, I mean, Homeworld came out in 99, in September of 99, and we shipped the game with a software version and a hardware version. So, you know, the software version was just utterly crap. I mean, and and even, you know, you, you would need a pretty decent, uh, machine in those days to 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 run Homeworld, so you know it it really pushed the the machines to its to it to you know to its limits. Um, but in terms of design, the biggest issue we really had to um, solve for was this was the fact that it was three D and in space. So Aaron Daly, who was the lead designer, you know, came up with this this um, awesome camera model involving selecting ships and focusing on selection sets and being able to rotate and, you know, at the poles, the camera would lock so that you wouldn't get, you know, inverted and disoriented. And, you know, in a nutshell, I mean, the, the, the full answer is, is very lengthy and detailed, but in a nutshell, we were trying to solve for all of the problems that a player would face in a 3D space environment. So, you know, orientation, um, you know, visibility, unit identification at a distance, uh, being able to make sense of the of the combat that was happening. So we had to come up with all sorts of systems to support that, and you know, give player visual and audio feedback that so they wouldn't be you know totally lost or confused. Uh, we had to implement a map uh, system. So at the time, RTS has had this little mini map in the in the corner of the screen that would. Yeah. The, uh, you know, with the little pixels of all, you know, and you could, uh, you could move around on that. And, you know, we tried that, but it was a disaster. You couldn't, you couldn't make any sense of it because for a start, everything's in 3D. But one of the, one of the big things we wanted to do with Homeworld, which at the time was a big innovation, was a scale representation that was sort of vaguely accurate. I mean, it was still utterly fake, but we wanted the small ships to sort of believably come from the belly of the big ships. So, you know, RTSs at the time, you'd have a tank that would come out of a tank factory and, you know, a tank factory wouldn't be a lot bigger than the tank. So, you know, it was very sort of, you know, abstracted. It was still fun and everything and looked cool, but it, it felt very abstracted and we wanted it much more like Star Wars, you know, with TIE fighters spewing forth from the belly of a destroyer kind of vibe. And, um, you know, to pull that off, we had to, we had to, you know, create quite extreme scale representation. So, you know, that was another big issue we had to, we had to, you know, tackle. So, you know, altogether, there was quite a bit of, you know, challenges to pull off a 3D space combat experience that wasn't an utter confusing disaster. (laughs) <laughs> I, I remember a lot of um, titles going from 2D to 3D, and you're right, the camera angle was always the really frustrating part about it for the player. And having those that, that, that kind of full orbit on the camera and the way that it could lock into ships as well was um, uh, yeah. really, really important for Homeworld. Yeah, I mean, you can imagine, like, you know, I mean, it's an, it's an incredibly fluid and dynamic um, environment that you're in there as a player. You know, you're... You're looking through this window, which is, of course, your monitor, um, at a world that is in just absolute turmoil. You've got, you know, because with Homeworld, you'd, you'd build a bunch of ships, you'd organize them in formations or a fleet, send them forth across the void. The enemy is approaching from the other direction. And then as soon as they make contact, it's just mayhem, you know, on the screen. Guys are going left and right and up and down and weaving between each other. And, you know, if you you, you got a lot of problems there that you got to solve for. So... Well, how did the need for users to recognize units from distance and all the angles play into the the design of the ships themselves in the game? Yeah, so it was uh, so when Aaron Daly came up with the fleet, you know, specs the the breakdown of ships. Um, it was really important for the two main factions to sort of match one another 
conceptually, right? Like a destroyer is a destroyer, a frigate's a frigate, a fighter's a fighter, kind of on both sides. But we wanted them to look as different and as distinctive as possible so that when you're looking through the screen at this mad sort of maelstrom of space combat, yeah, absolutely anything we could possibly do to to help you out <laughs> make sense of this mess, uh, we would do. So, you know, we we implemented these long engine trails that, that came out the back of the ships so that you could tell where they were and where they were going and where they'd been. Um, it also created this cool sort of smoke in the air sort of air show thing, which was which was very cool. Um, different colored engine trails. But the ships themselves um, had to have very clear and distinctive uh, silhouettes so that you could make positive ID on the ships at whatever distance. Um, you know, so the Titan fleet, for example, were brightly colored red and yellow striping, which, which was easy to see from quite some distance. And they also had like big wings sticking off them here and there and, and, and so on and so forth. So we really took pains to, to sort of design and test the the visual silhouette to make sure that they look different like if you took a mig fighter and a and an f-15 or whatever they look pretty similar you know and if you, you zoom out you really can't tell the difference between them and we didn't want that we wanted it to be clear that you know a titan fighter looked definitely different in as many ways as we possibly could to a Kushan. Especially on a 17-inch CRT monitor, I imagine. Absolutely, you know, running in software. That's kind of like, you know, you built them for necessity so that it, it, the users could uh, recognize them and they worked well, and then they became iconic pieces in their own right. Yeah, I mean, they, they um, it was really, I should say, really kind of rewarding for me and, and Aaron Cambitz to see, you know, how well the ship design were received by people and the sort of longevity of, of the, of those styles and those designs, we were really inspired by the artists, the sort of sci-fi book cover artists from the seventies and eighties, you know, like, you know, Peter Elson, Chris Foss, John Harris, these guys that do these spectacular paintings, um, you know, of brightly colored ships covered in pageantry and stuff. And, you know, and then, after Star Wars came along, you know, all of the ships in Star Wars were, were pretty much gray, you know, they didn't have a lot of color on them. I mean, they were all obviously awesome, like iconic, but but very, very gray. And we knew that if the, you know, and same deal with Battlestar Galactica and, uh, and so on. So, you know, at the time, we were inspired by these these ship designs and the look and feel of those franchises. But we knew that because Homeworld was a game, if everything was gray, you would be struggling, you know, to make sense of anything. So we were inspired by these guys, these artists from the past and and really sort of channeled their look and feel to sort of create these splashy ships that were very brightly colored, covered in decals and, you know, and, and very realistic, you know, very perhaps not realistic because they're still sci-fi fantasy, but you know what I mean? Like very plausible. And graphically beautiful as well. I mean, I'm quite interested in terms of the, the software and the hardware that was used for making them. I mean, what, what kind of 3D programs and hardware were you using for the rendering and, and the design of them? I think we were using LightWave. Yeah, I think yeah. it was LightWave. And, you know, we were just drawing. I mean, in terms of designing them, we would literally just draw them with pen on paper, uh, then scan the drawings and load them up in Photoshop and like hand paint the the, the paintings using mice, you know, using the mouse in Photoshop because <laughs> there was no Cintiqs or or anything back then. And then just, you know, hand bomb them in, in Lightwave and then, uh, you know, texture them up. So, you know, there wasn't, there, there really wasn't a very, you know, there was no off the shelf package for any of that stuff back then. Well, you, you mentioned the kind of accuracy of the scaling and making sure everything was in in the right perspective. I do remember a lot of the older RTSs would have, uh, you know, like huge humans or, you know, massive dogs and yeah. stuff like that. And it was all out of proportion. Did you think uh, people really appreciated the realism? Yeah, I think I think so. I think it made I, I think it just made the ships. You know, I think you could relate more to them. You know, one one of the things we knew because we weren't going to have characters was we knew that the ships themselves would be the characters uh, in the game. So, 
you know, the more character they had, the, you know, the cooler they looked, the more, the more, more distinctive they looked, the, you know, the way they sounded, you know, the audio of the game. It was, it was a classic case of, of, you know, being an artist with an extremely tight constraints. So, you know, often when you've got a creative challenge and, and incredibly tight constraints, you, 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 yeah, you're often successful because, you know, because you're working within very clear lines. You, you, you got to make it work. So, um, so yeah. We kind of touched on already, you know, the, the fact that hardware accelerated 3D graphics cards were kind of coming in, but not really standard for everyone. You know, voodoo cards and stuff are still quite expensive then. I mean, how did you kind of keep within the, the polygon and memory count then? Was that kind of a balancing act? Oh, my God. <laughs> Uh, yeah, balancing act, I'd say, is a very, very, you know, nice way of saying it. It was more like a hair on fire, mad freak out that lasted like two, two or three years. You know, um, the way we would, the way we we dealt with that was we we had extremely limited poly uh, and texture budgets to work with. Um, so you know, we would we would have to design these ships in a way that. That could be that could be modeled with very limited, you know, polygons, you know, which is actually kind of interesting because, you know, I, I I remember like reading something somewhere about the design of the, you know, some of the ships in Star Wars, particularly particularly the big ships, you know, like the Star Destroyers, were these giant, um, you know, triangular shaped things because it was relatively easy to build them. You know, you could just build massive sheets of wood and, you know, plywood and sort of screw them together and then cover them in, in, in detail. It was much the same for us on back in the day in Homeworld. You know, we had to, you know, hand bomb these polygons into shape and every ship had a very limited polygon budget. And then as you zoomed out, we, we had to go through, you know, um, procedural scaling to, to, you know, well, it wasn't procedural actually at the time we had to hand bomb each level of detail as the ship got smaller on screen and further away from the camera. So yeah, the, the, and you know, the texture budget was a really big issue. We had, I forget what the, what the budget was for the whole game, but it was laughable compared to modern games. Um, and Aaron Cambitz came up with this incredible method of squeezing detail into pixels that you just couldn't believe it. Like we, I think he called it the sub pixel detailing method or something where, <laughs> <laughs> you know, by some by some miracle, he was able to, you know, put pix colored pixels next to one another, and you know, miraculously articulate detail that just didn't exist in the texture. So you know, you want to you want to make a hole in the side of the ship, and there's a little highlight on one edge and a little shadow on the other, and it's literally like two pixels that are holding that information, and and inside there's just sort of like four pixels that are slightly different colored gray but from a just from a, the right distance it looks like there's some you know like a little carburetor or something in there you know <laughs> and your mind <laughs> does all the work so again you know massive um you know massive props to, to aaron Cambitz for for you know coming up with with how how we did this well, it's clear from, you know, what you're telling us so far, the, the amount of work and dedication that went into making the game. And it was, so you mentioned that you moved into an office above a nightclub. And, yeah. you know, I imagine that the game was originally meant to take a year and it ended up taking three yeah. years. I mean, what, what was kind of the culture like there then? And were, were you guys, I heard people like staying 24 hours a day in the office sometimes. Tell us a bit about what the kind of the culture was like at that time. Um, it was, uh, it was, it was kind of crazy, you know, I mean, we were all in our twenties. We were all, it was our first big proper gig. We were, you know, we were on our own. We were, you know, so, um, yeah, people slept at the office all the time, you know, that we'd be, we'd be working day and night. The nightclub would rage until whatever in the morning. And we, you know, we were smoking heaps of weed, you know, or some of us were, yeah. <laughs> we, uh, it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of, it was very stressful, but the team chemistry we had was, was really fantastic. And everybody really got along and everybody worked really hard. And there was this sort of fantastic sort of, I don't know how you would describe it. I guess like a, I guess like a meritocracy where everyone, every time someone did something awesome, it would just inspire everyone else to do something awesome in return. And so there was this sort of positive cycle of, of achievements that were happening sort of routinely. And, 
you know, of course, on the personal side, you know, it was a disaster. You know, everyone's girlfriends left them. You know, no one saw anyone from their family for ages. Everyone was wondering if we were all still alive, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but you know, we were all in our, in our early mid-20s and, you know, and this was our big thing. So we all knew that, that you know, we, we, just couldn't, we just couldn't cock this up. This had to be good. Well, one thing that really stood out uh, for me was the music in Homeworld. And it, it it kind of had that epic, that space epic feel. And, uh, but, you know, like a Space Odyssey to me. Where did that kind of classical music idea come from? And uh, how did it develop? Well, the theme song of the game came to Alex one morning by way of his alarm clock radio, where he woke up to the song playing on the radio and it was the Agnes Day song uh, by Samuel Barber and um, he immediately knew that this was going to be the theme song of of the game because it was it had this sort of epic sense of longing and um, you know it was just perfect so he played it for us and we were all like that's definitely the theme song and as for the rest of the score of the game that was entirely um, created by Paul Ruske over at Studio X in Vancouver. And, um, I mean, I, you know, I don't know how Paul does his thing, but, um, we were just creating these environments and the, the, you know, the ships, we had the story coming together. Um, and, and then we started making all the backgrounds and the lighting for the game and the, this sort of, you know, epic galaxy quest, you know, galaxy voyage, space voyage was starting to come together. And then, and then Paul just, printed out screenshots of all the locations and taped them to the wall of his music studio in a row. So he had the entire campaign of the game sort of sitting there on his wall in front of him. And he just started cranking out the music, just all of these, you know, ambient tracks one after the other to really set the tone and the feel for each location. And then, um, you know, scoring all of the cinematics as well. So, um, uh, and, and you know the the amazing thing about about what was being done at that time, and I've said I've said this before, but it's worth it's worth repeating is when it came to finaling Homeworld, there was no time for iteration at all. Mm. So the first version of everything we made, you know, with a couple of exceptions, but really not many, you know, was the thing that shipped with the game. So. Yeah. You know, when it came to the, you know, the cinematics that, you know, animatics, Aaron just drew and, and, and animated them and then rendered them and they were done. And then he'd hand them over to Paul and he would, just, Paul would just put audio to them and they were done. You know, with the backgrounds, I, I would just make one background after the other and, and that was it. That was the background that was, that was shipping with the game and so on and so forth. So it was sort of amazing. It all happened really very quickly in the, in the last year of production and really, you know, intensely in the last six months of production, um, this beautiful sort of carpet of uh, interactive experience just started sort of appearing in front of all of us. And it was magic. It was really quite magic. Every time someone would add something to the build, it, you know, we'd all play it and just be amazed and, and delighted. It was, uh, it was really quite a shocking, I don't think any of us had experienced anything like that at the time. Yeah, definitely feels like stuff was going at a pretty intense pace and, you know, the project growing rapidly as well. And there's one point of note, you know, kind of following on from the audio there as well, because, you know, my mum was a bit of a, uh, a prog rocker back in the day. And I know you had, um, I remember listening to like, you know, Owner of a Lonely Heart when I was a kid by the band Yes. Oh, yeah. And they actually, they actually did um, a song called Today for the, the soundtrack of Homeworld. So how did that come about then? And did you, did you guys get to meet them? Yeah, so uh, I, I have, um, okay, so... I might be wrong here, but I, if I'm not mistaken, what happened was we were just about finished with the game and we had released a beta to a bunch of people to play. And allegedly, I think the bass guitarist from the band uh, was one of the beta testers because he was a you know sci-fi fan or something or a gamer fan or whatever. And, right. you know, just thought it was awesome and shared, shared it with the band and, and they wrote that song our home is our world or whatever was, <laughs> you know, that song. And, uh, and they reached out to Sierra to tell them that, you know, that they had made this, they, they loved this game that we were working on and, and they made this song. And Sierra thought it would be really cool to, to get 
the the you know to get the song in the game because yes was like a 70s super band and the art of the game was inspired by the 70s artists so you know they thought it was a good connection and and I was like, yeah, right on. I mean, I was never a Yes fan, but I thought, yeah, right on. Let you know, chuck it in there. That sounds awesome. You know, <laughs> let's yeah. let's have it. I remember. I don't know if Alex was too keen on it. I remember him thinking, well, Yes was a band from you know decades ago. What's the relevance today? And you know, but whatever. You know, it's like it's, it's a, these guys are rock stars. Let's get them. Let's get them in the game. Um, so yeah, we met them. There was a some kind. Of, I think the release party was it was held in L.A. and there was some sort of press um, meeting that happened in a restaurant. You know, we were all down there. And then uh, apparently John, the lead singer from the band, wanted to talk to me. And so, you know, these marketing people came rushing up to me and they were all, you know, in a panic saying, you know, John, John wants to talk to you. You've got to get over there. You've got to get over there. And so I was like, okay, okay. And I sat down at the table and, and he was going on about wanting to, you know, do some tour it was a real sort of, you know, rock star moment where he was like this, this dude was going on about, you know, creating giant spaceships to float above the stadium in like hot air balloons or something or on cables. And, and he was, he, oh, wow. and, he, and then he got out a pen and started just drawing his vision of, of a home world experience in a stadium on the tablecloth of the restaurant, like actually on the actual cloth. And, you know, these photographers all got in a frenzy and started taking pics. And I remember just thinking, you know, this is awesome. This is just, this is never going to happen, but I'm, I'm loving this moment right now. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, we, we hung out with the band and, you know, and, and partied with them. It was, it was pretty fun. That sounds awesome. Um, Sierra, uh, we used to know them for, for huge adventure games and they were very like story driven. And, um, you guys had created this wonderful, you know, you know, technical achievement. And what, what time did, what point did the narrative kind of get in there and, and the story around it, like get created? Well, we knew, I mean, the game was called Homeworld. So we knew that it was something about, you know, getting to your homeworld. But the story itself didn't really start coming together until I guess about halfway through production when we, when we had gotten extensions and budget extensions from Sierra and and had realized that, you know, that we could never tell any kind of story unless we had some sort of pre-rendered cutscenes. And so, you know, they gave us a bunch more money to make this to, and more time to make all this stuff. And um, we got Martin Cyrillus to, to bang out a script, which was, I think Dave Williams was the, he is he's an old mate of mine from, um, from school. You know, he was a writer uh, and, he came up with the, he was also a historian, like he studied history. And, and I was like, Hey, Dave, you know, could you help us out? You're a military historian, you know, like, we've got this game, it's called Homeworld, it's about going home, you know, can you can you give us a hand here? And, and I think Dave came up with the basic premise, which was the Exodus story, right? Like, you know, something happened in the distant past, and your, you know, people were um, sent into exile, and, you know, far, far away across the galaxy. And, you were sort of marooned on this hostile desert planet and abandoned for millennia. And the people had, you know, suffered some sort of collective cultural amnesia and had no idea where they were from. So it was really a very, it, it was kind of a, a cool, I, I, we all thought it was a cool mashup of sort of, you know, historical, it sort of s s tasted like, you know, the Jewish exodus or something, you know, they had a cool sort of historical flavor, but also a very sort of relatable sort of teenage angst problem where you've got sort of like an identity crisis and your home doesn't really feel like home. And, you know, you, you've got this, you know, destiny that you're, you're, that, that you're supposed to, you know, fulfill or be somewhere, but that's all we had. And then, and then Martin Cyrillus fleshed that out into a, into a very rich script, which we then, you know, edited down into something that we could, we could produce. And then, like I said, it was the V, V, I think version, I think that we shipped like version two and a half of the script or something like it was, it was pretty, um, pretty much straight out the door. I remember at the time thinking, you know, feeling kind of embarrassed because we all thought that we were making a game for our peers or even people older than us. Uh, and that they would find the story sort of 
too cartoonish or comic booky, you know, and, the, and a bit silly. Um, <laughs> but it turned out that you know the people who loved the game the most and they were playing the game the most were were kids that were way younger than us, you know. So we shipped the game when we were all sort of, I think, the, you know, twenty five to twenty nine years old. But all of our key, you know, all of the players, all of the people who became fans were at the time, you know, between eight and 12 years old or 13 or whatever, right? Like much, you know, solid, solid younger, younger than us. And, you know, and they just totally connected with it. You know, they, we got all this feedback afterwards from people saying like, you know, I cried, it, it changed my life. <laughs> you know? like, it, was, it was one of the biggest things that uh, fans really, really invested in and got into that whole storyline and world and uh you know, it's kind of gone throughout the series as well, which is uh, absolutely fantastic. Yeah, it's it's a it's a great achievement to have that kind of, you know, you're fighting for something or you're trying to, yeah, you know, f- f- find your home world, but you're, you're kind of like the outcast as well or the underdog. Yeah, you know? you know, and then when it turns out that you know, you can imagine the sort of you know teenaged angst or pre teenaged angst happening with these kids that are playing the game and the story, which is all about. You know, you've been shafted and you're in the wrong place and it's not your home. And there's this whole question of origin and where are you from and who are you? And then when it turns out that there's some big bad enemy that sort of shafted you in the past and, you know, there's this whole revenge thing happening because they come and kill everybody. There's nobody left but you and your mothership. And so you've got this sort of axe to grind and, and, you know, I think a lot of people sort of connected with the story on a personal level, you know, which uh, we didn't expect at all. Well, how did you represent the the fog of war to the users? Yeah, so fog of war um, was and is a, a sort of RTS staple, um, and the way we did it was in um, we we used the render list, which was the the distance from the camera that ships could be drawn. And combined it with the the what we call blue blobs or the spheres in the census manager map. So in the map of the game, when you zoomed out to map, you know, to map mode, uh, all of the you know fog of wars were represented as blue spheres, semi-transparent blue spheres in in this in this mode. And if there was an enemy unit around, it was only visible if it was within the fog of war or visibility sphere of one of your units. So, you know, and then it would appear as a, as a, you know, as a red dot, um, in this sort of air traffic control radar screen type, type view, uh, only, you know, obviously in 3d. So, yeah, so that's how we did it. So, so the gameplay was all about, you know, sneaking around in the space between spheres. I was wondering when you, when you got onto, um, Homeworld 2 as well, there was a huge, uh, uh, multiplayer aspect on that. What, what were the considerations needed when you were doing a multiplayer um, kind of section of the game? Um, well, I'm sure if you were talking to Luke, he could tell you all about the technical um, uh, issues there. But from a, from a gameplay design perspective, the multiplayer game, you know, one of the things, you know, it, it, obviously it's a multiplayer RTS, so you've got a map with a bunch of players in various corners of the map fighting over um, limited resources and then duking out in a big battle. So all of the sort of classic multiplayer issues, you know, faced us too, you know, such as um, comeback mechanisms. You know, if you start losing a game like that, you know, it's just a question of how quickly do you lose? You can't really come back and, and fight. So we, we're implementing all sorts of things to sort of, you know, help with that, like, you know, being able to hyperspace around the map and, and transferring command from the mothership to a carrier if your mothership died and you know stuff like that which was only featured in the in the in the multiplayer in the multiplayer game so you know i i don't remember too much in the way of multiplayer specific issues or challenges that we faced other than like i said these sort of you know the expected stuff I was never terribly good at playing Homeworld. I always got my ass kicked in the office. But <laughs> well, another thing um, that that's really important with an RTS is resources. And um, you know, in Command and Conquer, you've got uh, Tiberium. Where did the idea of like salvaging ships um, come from, and having a, a salvage team? Well, Aaron Daly came up with the 
the entirety of the resource model. And we wanted there to be multiple ways to collect resources in the, in the game. So you had your natural resources, which were asteroids and nebula. Um, and, and you had, uh, you, you know, but, but we wanted there to be something that was associated with, um, you know, enemy units. So Aaron Daly came up with the salvage uh, mechanism which was implemented as corvettes that would look like little tugboats and you know if you if you got enough cor the salvage corvettes attached to an enemy ship you could steal that ship um and you know integrate it into your fleet so you know it was a really cool it was a really cool um mechanic in the game i don't think we tuned it very well so i think it ended up being a bit of an exploit in the single player game <laughs> But it worked pretty well, and it was it was a lot of fun. It was super satisfying to you know to steal the other guy's stuff. Yeah, and a lot of the time it was the kind of quickest way of you know improving and and, and getting your fleet uh, a lot bigger. Yeah, I mean that's what I mean by not tuning it super well. Well, back in um, I think it was around 2015, wasn't it when the when Homeworld got a remaster? Yeah, and and that was very well received. I mean, you know, looking at that, what, what kind of improvements in in that were you most proud of? Uh, when Gearbox acquired the IP from THQ's bankruptcy proceedings, I guess that would have been like 2013 when that went down. We, I, we, I, re I immediately reached out to them and, and congratulated them on the purchase and, and told them, hey, you know, we got this new studio called Blackbird and we're working on this ground-based desert, you know, RTS that, or quasi-RTS that, you know, very much looks and you know, sort of feels like Homeworld. We should, we should talk. So. That's when we made the deal to to create um, Deserts of Karak as a prequel to Homeworld One, and at the same time they were working on remastering the original two titles. So they came to us and said, "Hey, you know, you guys made this thing. You know, could you, you know, because because Blackbird team had a bunch of people, old old school people from Relic at the time who had worked on on Homeworld, including Aaron Cambitz and myself, and and so on. So." Um, so we, they, they, they contracted us in a sort of advisory capacity to help them remaster the original two titles. So, so Gearbox deserve all of the high fives for the quality of the remaster itself. Um, the, the X relic X homeworld blackbird team provided all of the backgrounds to the, to the, um, to the remastered games and all of the remastered animatics. We helped out a little bit with the art direction too, you know, on the on the ships and and so on, and what they should look like. But it was it was very much handled by the internal Gearbox team, um, and they did a really fantastic job. We were in touch with them like literally all the time, so it felt very much like a collaboration. But but yeah, they they did a really they did a really fantastic job there. And I imagine having you guys involved as well was, you know, really helped because you know, remastering something, particularly something that people are very passionate about, can always be a dangerous kind of yeah. thing. So you don't want to get it wrong. So yeah, exactly. yeah, I guess well, having you guys advising them really helped. At the time, Gearbox's creative officer was Brian Martell, who is, is himself a, a, a huge, um, a huge sci-fi fan. So Brian was the art director on, you know, Borderlands and is a, extremely gifted um, art director uh, and 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 art enthusiast so he was the he was the sort of you know drive behind acquiring the IP and and the the remastering of the game so uh, of the games so you know and we were in contact with him through deserts of Karak and so we very much it was sort of me and Brian Martel that were sort of the contact points Brian representing gearbox and myself representing Blackbird. And we kind of built Deserts of Karak and Homeworld 1 and 2 remastered kind of all at the same time. I think they finished the remaster just before we, uh, it came out before Deserts. Like I think it came out in 15 and Deserts came out in 16. But um, they were pretty much all all guns blazing. And, and, you know, it was pretty intense Homeworld couple of years for us all. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's kind of great that, you know, people can play it all on the modern systems as well. Yeah. And, uh, I was just wondering as well what happened with the um, the expansion um, Cataclysm. Um, it came out as Emergence, and I heard it was because there was like some missing source code or something. Yeah, I don't, I don't really remember what the deal was with that. I mean, Cataclysm was was made back in the day by Barking Dog Studios, and when Gearbox acquired the the IP, I think they had some kind of trouble finding 
all the source the source data for that for that game. But um, yeah, I don't know what happened with that. I think they finally did get their hands on it or something. But but yeah. Yeah, yeah, and then kind of renamed it, but it is out on GOG, which is uh, yeah. really good to see. Um, yeah, yeah. I was, I was wondering what was your, what, what's been your favorite experience working on the Homeworld series? Then is there anything that really stood out for you? I could, I could wax nostalgic about the making of the game and the incredible experiences with Paul Ruske and Aaron Cambitz and and the the Homeworld team back at Relic. But you know, to be honest, I think. Now, looking back from today, I'd probably have given you a different answer if you'd asked me that question, you know, 10 years ago. But today, I think my my favorite part of the whole experience is the feedback that I've had from fans in the years since. And some of the letters people have written uh, about how the game touched them or affected them and their lives or their choices. And, you know, it's it's really hard to to put into words how touching it is when you when you I mean all we're talking about here is a silly video game you know but but <laughs> but you know some people it, it really touched them and and they um they were deeply grateful and and they're just very articulate and you know some went on to become you know astrophysicists others got involved in video games themselves or narrative design you know, I, there was one guy who who said that it completely redefined his experience as a Jew in grow, you know growing up in his family because of the the Jewish Holocaust story. So he, had, yeah. you know, the genocide theme that was going on in Homeworld, you know, really you know impacted him personally quite a lot, and it he said it changed the way he understood his parents and grandparents. I mean, you know, things you would never ever imagine you know, um, at the time, you know, come, come to pass. And I think that that's, you know, and, and seeing other games, you know, replicate the style or, you know, people referencing, you know, people referencing their art, the, the art of Homeworld and, you know, amazing artists like Paul Chatterson, you know, doing riffs on, on it and stuff. I mean, that, that's all very touching, but I think, I think, um, I think the feedback from fans that that would be my favorite part. That's a really nice answer. And obviously right now, I mean, you know, we're on the cusp of Homeworld 3 yeah. coming out soon. I don't know, there's NDAs and all that floating around, I imagine. But from what I've heard about it, I mean, you know, I've heard the scale of this game is tremendous, way beyond anything we've seen before. I mean, what can you tell us about Home Homeworld 3 then and how is that coming on? Well, I mean, okay, so the short answer is it's coming on great. <laughs> and it's It's... I think in okay, so I'm obviously super biased. So you know, talk to someone else, but for sure. But in my opinion, it's if not the most pretty, it's one of the most pretty science fiction things I've ever seen. I just love it. It just looks so cool. The art team at Blackbird have done such an incredible job. Carl and his team. Um, so so it. it it's definitely worthy just in terms of how it looks, how it sounds, how it plays. It's it's incredibly authentic to the IP. It's just oversaturated with homeworld vibes and flavors. You know, people, fans familiar with the franchise are just gonna are just gonna love that. Um, and I think new fans are, are gonna be tasting it for the first time and, and loving it too. Um, but yeah, the, the scale is massive. I mean, it, you know, I've said before that, home, you know, the spirit of Homeworld 3 was really born in the conception of Homeworld 2 uh, in the early oh. 2000s, but we were utterly unable to pull off that scale um, with the, the space terrain and geometry that we had in mind at the time. But now it's completely possible and, and it's happening in Homeworld 3. So um, you know, without, you know, violating any disclosure agreements or or letting any cats out of the bag, I, I can explain a little bit. Homeworld 3 is going to feature um, space geometry by way of, you know, artificial constructs like, you know, ancient hyperspace gates, but also in addition, you know, asteroid, f you know, fields and, and ice fields and features in the 3D environment that will affect the flow of the game, the strategy game, and the distribution of resources 
in a really interesting way. So, you know, for the first time, you know, in a, in a, in a homeworld game, you'll be able to exploit choke points, you know, like unit filtration areas where only small ships can pass through, but the big ships have to go around. Um, you'll be able to deploy, you know, various units that are terrain specific or deal with the terrain in the gameplay in specific ways. You'll be able to fly inside the terrain and exploit cavities within the terrain for various gameplay wins like stealth and so on. So you've got the basic RTS sort of sandwich happening of, you know, resourcing production um, and combat. Um, but it's now layered in to this three-dimensional geometry, the three-dimensional strategy game. Um, and again, set against this spectacularly beautiful, uh, you know, environment with a story that is a continuation of the story that is sort of left hanging at the end, at the end of Homeworld 2 with this discovery of this gate system in the galaxy. So it's super exciting. It, it feels wonderful to be working on it. And, and, you know, I really can't wait to, to get it into people's hands. Oh, Rob, it sounds epic. I mean, are we still on course for a, a release first half of this year, do you think? Yeah. Is that still happening? I think, I think you'd have to reach out to the Gearbox team for more specific yeah. date, uh, release date information. But what I can tell you is that it's going super well. Um, we're super excited. And uh, I, really, I really can't wait to hear what people think. Well, Rob, it's been an absolute pleasure chatting to you and thank you so much for spending some time to reminisce with us and uh we can't wait to see the work that you and the guys have done on uh homeworld 3 so uh, best of luck with it we can't wait to play it well um, and thanks so much for coming on and being our guest thanks so much the pleasure is 100 percent mine I, I, that was really it was really fun and um thanks so much 